Hey everyone, I'm Wolfgang. Hey, it's Kayla. I'm Jackson. And I'm Izzy. And this is Safe and Sober. Today we're going to take a look at a really big issue in our community, opioid use. We'll drop in on a real conversation about how our friends have a big influence on our opinions when it comes to making safe choices. Then we will hear a local mom's story on how her life was changed forever after she lost her daughter to a drug overdose. But first, let's learn the facts about opioid addiction. Hi, I'm Sarah and you're watching Be Careful Out There Teens. Today, we're going to talk about opioids. What are opioids? Well, this actor dressed up like a scientist is going to tell us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, scientist. Hi. Scientist, what are opioids? Well, Sarah, an opioid is basically a super powerful painkiller. Some opioids are legal and have medical purposes when prescribed by a doctor. Medications like uh, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and morphine are all opioids with medical purposes. Well, aren't there also illegal opioids, scientist? There sure are, Sarah. Heroin is the most well-known and it has absolutely no medical purpose. So we shouldn't do heroin. Correct. <laughs> Good to know, scientist. Now that we know what opioids are, can you tell us some statistics about how dangerous they are? You bet! In 2017, more than 190 million opioid prescriptions were given out in the United States. That same year, over 11 million people aged 12 and older reported misusing their prescription, and over 45,000 people actually died from an opioid overdose. Nearly a thousand passed away in Missouri alone. Wow, this is a serious problem. It sure is, Sarah. But if opioids are so dangerous, why do people misuse them? Great question. When someone takes an opioid, it floods the brain with a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine makes you feel happy. Your brain feeling happy doesn't seem so bad. What's the problem with that? Well, that's the sneaky thing about addiction. At first, opioids will make you feel happy and high. But that feeling goes away when the drug wears off. And when it does, your brain will crave that dopamine rush again. The problem is that every time you use an opioid to get high, it takes more and more of the drug to create the same feeling. That's called tolerance. Okay, so tolerance is when you need more and more of a drug to experience its effects. Exactly. And eventually, if you keep giving your brain opioids, your brain and body will start to rely on them just to feel normal. This is what we call dependence, as you are now dependent on that chemical. Wow, that sounds kind of terrible. Why don't people just stop? It's not that easy, Sarah. Remember, at this point, your brain and body are dependent on this chemical. Once you remove it, it will cause terrible side effects like depression, hallucinations, chills, and severe intestinal pain. This is what we call withdrawal. So withdrawal is what happens when you stop taking opioids after you are dependent on them. Precisely. This is why so many people get caught in this deadly cycle. Withdrawal pains are horrible and your body always needs more and more opioids to not experience withdrawal. And the human body can only handle so much of this drug before it completely shuts down. This is why over 45,000 people died overdosing on opioids in 2017. Wow, that's super sad, scientist. It sure is, Sarah. It sounds like all those teens out there should be super careful if they're ever prescribed an opioid. That's exactly right. It's easier than you might think to get hooked. According to the Mayo Clinic, after just five days of opioid use, the chances of dependence goes up drastically, increasing your chance of addiction and overdose. Yikes. In fact, 80% of heroin users were first prescribed painkillers by their doctors. So, if you're ever prescribed painkillers, whether it's for an injury or something as simple as having your wisdom teeth removed, you need to be very careful. Do you have any tips for us, scientist? I sure do, Sarah. 
If you're prescribed an opioid by your doctor, ask if there are other medication options available to treat the pain. If you are taking opioids prescribed by a doctor, never take more than instructed. Never share your medication with anyone and never take someone else's medication. If you have concerns about drug use, talk to a doctor or a trusted adult. And finally, remember that you are likely to become like the people you hang out with. So choose your friends wisely. So scientists, let me get this straight. You're saying I probably shouldn't hang out with people who misuse opioids. Exactly. Good to know. Thanks, scientist. You're welcome. This has been Be Careful Out There, Teens. Coming up next week, cliffs. Just because your friends are jumping off them doesn't mean you should. See you next time. Whoa, I had no idea what an opioid even was, let alone the impacts it has on our bodies. Goes to show just how important it is to use medication safely. It's crazy how much of an influence our friends have on us. It matters who we let influence us. Let's hear how we can make sure our friends are pushing us in the right direction. Okay, you guys, uh, today we're here with college students and we're going to talk about relationships and the impact that we all have and they all have on us. So. Why don't we just introduce ourselves? Uh, I'm John, I'm a senior in college. I'm Darian, I'm a college senior. I'm Josiah and I'm a senior in college. I'm Lauren and I'm a senior in college. So uh, tell me about your friends in high school or junior high, like what were they like? My friendships were a lot more shallow as far as school goes. I found a lot of my closer friends in sports outside of school. Um, and there's some people that I still see from high school, but a lot of the people that I was friends with in middle school and high school were just, I was just friends with them because I saw them at school, if that makes sense. Whenever I was in high school, I felt as if the more friends I had, the more popular I was and the cooler I was. And so more friends equaled more um, popularity. And I, that's what I thought whenever I was in high school. Um, little did I know that's not very true in the real world. Um, <laughs> um, and so what I did was as I started to know more people, I started to know their habits and I started to know that they also did drugs as well. They did offer me some and I did say no, but then I also thought and I was like, is this, should I maybe say yes? Because that I still want to become really good friends with them. I thought that when I was in high school that that was who I was going to be forever. And so when I was sitting there on Friday nights when some of my friends were out at parties getting drunk and I was there alone with my dog, <laughs> I was like, wow, this, is, this isn't this is going to be fun. You know, this is going to be me being isolated my whole life. And there's so much more beyond that. And I realized then, or I guess I realize now, that those people who made me feel like that weren't actually good friends. What advice would you have um, regarding drugs and alcohol and the peer pressure that you feel, maybe like when you were in junior high or high school, if you're talking to that group of, of you back then, what advice would you give them? I felt like the peer pressure was strongest because you feel like you're missing out. Like, you feel like everyone else is having all this fun and doing all this cool stuff, and even if it revolves around something you know that you're not supposed to do or you know that you really don't want to do, it's not something that really draws you. There's still the point of kind of the fact that society has turned it almost into a rite of passage. Like, oh, like, I'm in high school now, I can drink. Or I'm in college now, so I have to drink and I have to go to all these parties and I have to experiment with things I know that aren't good for me. If, if you have values and morals that, uh, kind of a code that you've set for yourself, don't stray from those because somebody wants you to or because you feel like it's what you have to do if it's something that you don't necessarily want to do. Um, I would always make sure that it's something that you really think about and evaluate and take the time to really understand before you, you make a decision because there is always room for growth, um, but some areas aren't worth growing into. 
it only takes one time for you to take too much or drink too much for it to either end your life or alter your life to where it's never gonna be the same. Um, I lost my cousin when I was 11 to an opiate overdose. Um, and I don't know exactly what it was, but it was a mixture of a lot of things. And he didn't know that that was gonna kill him. Um, he didn't know that he had just a little bit too much in there. Um, and that can go with anything. I mean, you can drink too much and then you get in the car and you think that it's not gonna affect you or affect anybody else and then you're too drunk to drive and you hit another car and you might kill yourself or you might kill somebody else and alter you know, somebody else's life. So, so many people can be affected by you making a decision to, that you shouldn't make. The three things I think about is how is this gonna affect my health? How is this gonna affect me as a person? And how is it gonna affect the people around me? My great aunt died three years ago, overdosing on pills. Um, she, you know, it started really young um, and kind of, you know, her health was bad. It affected her as a person, uh, but also the people around her, her kids were addicted to pills because of it. Um, and they still are addicted to drugs because of the choices she made. So the choices you make not only affect you, but also those around you. What are some ways that you've learned how to make good choices? High school, middle school, all of that, it's such a transformative time in your life, like you said earlier, and it's easy to be a high school student and look at high school like it's the rest of your life, and that you're so old and experienced and you know everything about the world. You have your whole life ahead of you, even if it feels like you don't. And it's easy to feel so grown up at that point when you're not. And it's important to always think about the future when you're making decisions and think about the long life that you can live and think about things that might shorten it and might, like you guys talked about earlier, impact other people because they, your reach is farther than you think it is, no matter if you, if you know that or not. Somebody looks at you and finds inspiration or looks at you and sees somebody that they want to be like, someone somewhere looks up to you. So when make, that, make your decisions for them, even if you don't know who they are. Well, thank you all for sharing so many great stories and great tips for our junior high and high school people. Um, we love them. We know that they can be successful. And so thank you for your time with them. Last year alone, over 45,000 Americans died because of an opioid overdose. These aren't just numbers. These are real people with real families. In this next video, we're going to hear one mom's story of how she lost her daughter to an opioid overdose. We should warn you that this video could be disturbing to some viewers. Samantha, she, she was always just an amazing girl. She was happy, uh, she loved everybody, she treated everybody the same. You know, anytime she walked in the room, it was like the whole entire room lit up, you know, everybody, she just walked in smiling. I mean, everybody just adored her, everybody adored her. Not just our family, but I mean, it really crushed us. It's really put a hole in our lives that is obviously never gonna be filled. I mean, it, it took a toll on all of us. She was very important to all of us. When Sam was 16, um, she was driving to school from Fairgrove on a curvy road early in the morning. She said she remembered looking up looking down at the time and then looking back up and there was a school bus 
So she swerved to make sure she was in her lane and she overcorrected and flipped the car like three or four times and was out in a field. It was like eight in the morning, I got a call from the police uh, saying that my daughter had been involved in a car accident. And of course I was frantic, I didn't know. They couldn't tell me anything except she was, she was talking and coherent. Um, so I got to the hospital and uh, they had her, you know, all braced up and everything. She didn't really remember a lot, but she had um, three spots in her back that were broken. So we went, you know, the emergency room, they gave her pain pills. She was a person that didn't like to take pills. Like even if she was sick, I don't want to take liquid. I don't want to take pills. I don't want to take any of that stuff. So I thought, well, she's not going to take it. I'm sure that the pain was so bad that, you know, she was to the point where, okay, I've got to take something. I, I can't deal with this. She would just cry from the pain. And so she started taking them. I didn't know anything about pain pills really or addiction or nor was I warned. Um, you know, hey, you, she might get addicted to these or hey, watch this or nothing. I had no clue. I'm just thinking, well, my my baby has broken her back in three spots. Give her whatever she needs. She took those probably for like six months or so. And then when she was out, I kind of noticed like a pill here or there, like on the floor or in her room. And I was like, well, what is this? And she's like, well, it's just Xanax, you know. I, the pain is too too strong, I can't deal with it. it you know, it constantly hurts. And you know, we, we were close, so we always discussed everything. Um, you know, why are you taking these? Where are you getting these? And tried to encourage her to go a different route. We had her in counseling. Um, she was, we, they put her on um, antidepressants. Of course, she didn't want to take those pills, so she never really did. Um, she did counseling for a while, and then she just kind of refused to go anymore. She said it wasn't helping her. When Sam initially told me that, Mom, I'm addicted to heroin, I think I, I'm sure my mouth dropped open, and I just kind of sat there and stared at her for a minute. But instead of freaking out and yelling and screaming, I was just like, okay, um, I don't need to know how it happened. You know, we can talk. I mean, I knew she was scared to death. And so I was, I just, I had to take a few breaths and go, all right, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's fight it. Um, so we got her on Suboxone. Um, it seemed to help. But, uh, I don't know, we went, she went through treatment there. Um, she never had a clean urine test. She was doing coke. She was using the subs and they weren't helping. She was still here in the same environment around the same people when she left treatment. And it was right in front of her all the time. So she, she just couldn't, couldn't do it. So we went to bed Saturday night, uh, probably 12-ish. And my room is across from her room and I was laying on the outside of the bed, just kind of staring out the door thinking, I don't know, I just had a, a feeling. And so I tried to go to sleep, I went to sleep. Um, I woke up maybe an hour later and seen her walking down the hall, she was just bouncing and so happy and her hair was flying and she was had her in a book and she's like I'm gonna go in my room and meditate and I'm like okay so this was September 3rd 2017 about 4 30 in the morning I woke up and I sat straight up and was like okay something's wrong and I just immediately got up went to Sam's room her door was locked uh, I just pushed it open because I'd had to get in there before and I knew when I saw her that she was gone, uh -huh. uh, but she was sitting there um, with her legs crossed and her head down on her bed and her arms laying beside her. And it was like instant sickness. Like I knew, I just knew 
And so I went over to her and I sat her up and um, you could tell that she had thrown up a little bit and that her face was puffy from laying in it. And I knew, but I tried to feel for her pulse and her neck was so stiff and her mouth was so clenched that everything was just hard. You couldn't even find anything. So I yelled for my husband and he came running in and I told him to call 911. Um, he, he was in there and said, put her on the floor. And I'm like, I can't, like, I'm just in shock. I couldn't move. I was just like, so he picked her up and put her on the floor and um, started chest compressions. Um, like I said, her mouth was too clenched, so you couldn't even get it open to try to give her CPR. They got her on a gurney in her room and brought her into the living room. <laughs> and she was in a body bag. And so they left the top open so I could hug her and kiss her and talk to her. And I spent some time with her and then they zipped her up and took her out, just like it was nothing. I watched her go out, I watched them put her in the car. I watched her drive away and I just lost it in the driveway. I would just ask everybody to take another look at, at your life and what you're doing and take a step back and, and realize that this does happen to anybody and everybody and just prepare yourself for when these things are put in front of you. Overdose death rates have increased over 400% in the past decade. Opioids are incredibly addictive, and this really can happen to anyone. Today, you have the chance to make a big difference. You have the opportunity to take the pledge to be safe and sober. Your life is important. You are important. And you deserve to live an awesome life and reach all your goals and dreams. One of the best ways to do this is to avoid drugs and alcohol. Choose to protect yourself. Choose to protect your friends and family. Choose to be safe and sober. Okay, uh, Grace, you want to get us started? No one asked me if I wanted to be here. I didn't choose where I was born or where I grew up or who my parents are. It's like I'm a character in a play that's happening right now and no one thought to ask me if I wanted to be in it. But I get to choose what I dream about. I get to choose what I'm passionate about. I get to choose where I go next. It's not just that drugs and alcohol are bad for me. I know that, duh. It's that I don't have time for distractions. And I don't need another thing that controls me. My dreams are too big. My next step is too important. I can't control how I got here, but I'm the only one who gets to decide where I go from here. 